Good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn off their mobile phones, as it does interfere with the sound system? Uh, first agenda is uh, agenda item one, subordinate legislation. Uh, the committee will have seen the papers that came from the previous committee. I would wonder if the committee is content to note the instrument, uh, but also to write to the Scottish Government, seeking responses to the issues raised in the evidence session of the 7th of September. Are the committee content? Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Now going to agenda item two, and that's uh, further evidence of Social Security Bill. It's a continuation of our evidence, and we have two panels of witnesses today. Can I welcome our first panel, and thank you very much for managing to get here so early and on such a miserable day, uh, basically. Uh, can I welcome Jessica Burns, uh, Regional Tribunal Judge, Social Security and Child Support, John Dickey, Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland, Peter Kelly, Poverty Alliance, and Dr Jim McCormick, uh, Joseph Rowntree Foundation. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'll just start off by asking the first question, a kind of general question that covers most of the bill. Uh, can I ask the panel, uh, what are your thoughts on including principles in the bill and on the seven principles set out and intended to underpin uh, the new social security system? Uh, who would like to kick off first? Uh, Peter, Peter yep, Kelly. I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. Um, Thank you for the invitation to come along and give evidence. Um, the Poverty Alliance has obviously been working on issues of, around Social Security for many years, have advocated the uh, uh, devolution of further powers to the Scottish Parliament. So we're really pleased and uh, welcome the, the process that, that this uh, committee is part of. Um, I guess there's, there's a number of areas where, um, like others on, on this panel and others in the voluntary sector, have, have broadly welcomed um, the bill and the content of the bill, and I think uh, with the with the principles, I think we have again broadly welcomed those. We, um, over many years, have talked about issues around dignity and respect, um, and I think it's important that those are reflected uh, on the face of the bill, and um, and and that that human rights approach is is given real meaning. I guess one area where we think perhaps there is a gap in the principles is around uh, the role of Social Security, setting out the, the role of Social Security as preventing and tackling poverty, um, that, that that perhaps could be included as one of the principles in the bill as well. Thank you very much. Um, John Dickey? Uh, yes, I mean, I think we very much welcome the, the, the principles that the government uh, has set out and the overall approach it's taken uh, in terms of um, the, the language and the approach it's wanting to take to Social Security, um, support the idea of embedding the principles that have been laid out in legislation. I think the key challenge now is to ensure that those principles and the policy intentions and ambitions that have been put around Social Security policy are now translated into the detail of the bill um, throughout the bill. So the principles aren't just a section at the front of the bill, but the, the, the intent the, and, and the principles set out are actually reflected in the detail of the, uh, the, the, the legislation and the rules for Social Security uh, throughout the bill. So I suppose that's the area we're particularly keen to explore in more detail, how we can ensure that the that, that those principles and the wider policy intent that the, the government has taken to Social Security are actually reflected in the detail of the rules for Social Security. Uh, Dr McCormick, or... Thank you. Um, so I, I very much welcome uh, the, the bill as well and would agree with comments so far. I guess um, in terms of principles, I think the bill could say more about genuine accessibility so government has made important pledges already about take up. Um, uh, we saw this week some figures from DWP on, on take up and there are huge variations uh, in legacy GB benefits around take up. And there is a commitment in Scotland to try and do something about that um, to perform better. To do that, I think we need to be talking more about accessibility and that would lead us to a conversation, I think, around um, the different channels that people can use, but also around rights to independent advocacy and advice mm -hmm. and, and understanding what the landscape across Scotland looks like in order to um, uh, make sure we can realise that principle of, 
of, um, of accessibility. There's a lot more to say about the balance between primary legislation and, and, and subordinate and so forth, but we, we, we may come on to that. I think we will. Uh, Jessica Burns. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I suppose um, I do support what my other um, uh, witnesses have said, but my reservation about this is that obviously um, the, the control of social security will not be entirely within um, Holyrood's uh, grasp. And I think that there might be issues of how the public perceive the two parallel systems that are going to exist. And I think that's something that um, the ha there has to be quite a lot of detail within the regulations. Um, I mean, I know there's the top-up powers, but it's not at all clear how that will work and how things will work cross-border either. And I just perhaps um, put out a few uh, warning concerns about that. Absolutely. And if I could just pick up, and I mean, I know people are going to come in with various ones about the principles as well, and the subordinate legislation, etc. But uh, Jessica Burns, you mentioned about the fact that there may be a bit of difficulty there. Would that be similar to what Dr. McCormick saying about accessibility? Should, although accessibility for people being able to reach their benefits, but also being told what benefits they're actually entitled to under the devolved powers, would that fit in with the accessibility that Dr. McCormick's talking about? Well, it is all about accessibility, um, and uh, I think it really depends a lot on the provision of advice and assistance. And I know that the plan seems to be that the Social Security Agency will be very enabling in that role, but that there will still be a role for um, independent uh, advice workers to help people navigate through the system. And I'm not quite sure how those handoffs um, will take place because clearly there'll still be the conditionality around universal credit and assessments under that. And it's not clear whether there'll be any sharing of information in relation to those sorts of assessments if we're going on to look at issues to do with the disability criteria. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> oh, John Dickey, want to come in? It's Adam Tonk. Yes, yeah, just on, on this issue of, of accessibility, I suppose just to suggest a couple of um, specific ways in which the bill could be strengthened to, 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 to try and ensure that people are able to access and get the, 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 the assistance they're entitled to. So one is, as a principle um, set out in the bill, the Scottish Government has a role a role in making sure that people are given the social security assistance they're eligible for. I mean, that should be strengthened so that it has a duty to ensure that people are getting the, the social, that are given the social security assistance that they're entitled to. <coughs> and then an additional duty, um, we, we've suggested an additional duty which uh, on ministers to, um, to, to, to devise and implement uh, and regularly review a strategy uh, on reducing underclaiming of devolved social security payments. There's a, there's a big issue, particularly in relation to disability benefits, in, in terms of underclaiming. Um, so a duty to regularly review, um, to produce a strategy and regularly review that strategy to ensure that uh, we're maximising um, uptake up of these devolved benefits would be, a, 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 you know, a way of strengthening um, that that duty and that principle of, of accessibility. Uh, thank you. Does any other panel want to come back on that before I bring in Mr Tomkins? Okay, Adam Tomkins. Thank you, Gavina. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to take us to sections one and two um, of the bill, the general principles and the, and the charter. Um, and I wonder if I could um, uh, ask for your reflections on the written evidence that we've received on this from my colleague at Glasgow Law School, Tom Mullen, who says, and I quote, that it's difficult to work out the intention behind section one of the bill. And if its legal status is not clarified, citizens and their advisers may be unsure what their rights are. The parliament, he says, should press ministers to make clear precisely what their intentions are as to the legal status and effect of the principles uh, and to present amendments which clearly give effect to that int intention. Do you agree with what Professor Mullen has said? Who wants to kick off in that particular one? Jessica Burns? Well, the, the, the test of any legislation is when it's in operation to see what the levels of satisfaction and uh, delivery um, are. And I don't think that means there shouldn't be principles to start off with. 
because it does provide a kind of road map uh, where the regulations can, can pick up and can deliver. A, and it's not uncommon. I mean, in tribunal rules, there's an overriding objective, which is uh, very... Um, you know, altruistic and perhaps not always delivered, but it's still um, trying to uh, underpin some sort of principle. So I, I don't necessarily share his concerns at the moment uh, because um, any legislation is always capable of amendment to try and meet those principles. Anyone else in the panel want to come back on that particular one? Dr McCormick? That, so, to be honest, it's well outside um, my area of expertise, but I suppose a, a comment would be um, w with something as complex as this, even within the limits of the person budgets coming to Scotland, um, there's going to be an element of um, testing out the various provisions through the regulations and through the practice. Um, I think ministers should absolutely be pressed by you and others to give an account of their thinking around the balance between principles, values, and broad direction in the bill, how much should be set in primary legislation and how, how much can safely be left to secondary regs and guidance, I think the balance currently is not right. So I think pressing on that would be helpful. Um, and making sure that the provisions for you know, admin justice, redress, complaints, and recourse to law um, at the end of the process, making sure that that looks as safe and deliverable as possible at this stage. <coughs> and I think in the next session, the work that Ulster University have done for EHRC Scotland may be helpful in, in, in a comparative sense in that regard. Can, can, can I just press you then um, a little bit on, on, on one, one, one particular aspect of this? Um, um, the, the Scottish Government have said many times, and they've been, uh, warm, this has been warmly welcomed um, uh, by a number of parties, uh, that they want to pursue a human rights-based approach to devolved social security. Um, one of our human rights, according to our most important human rights instrument, the European Convention on Human Rights, in Article 13, is um, the right to effective judicial protection of our human rights. So do any members of the panel think that if we are serious about having a human rights approach to devolved social security, then one of the elements of that approach must be um, the ability to take human rights-based claims to court, um, where uh, claimants or others are of the view that their rights to dignity, fairness, and respect have not been satisfied. And if you do think that, do you think that the bill should reflect that on its face? Who wants to come in on that one? Uh, Jessica Barnes, did you want to clarify? Well, uh, in any social security system there's going to be conditionality and there's going to be a sense of grievance by people who are found not to meet that conditionality they may think that because that they haven't met um, the criteria for the benefit that somehow they've been disrespected and their dignity uh, has not been um, uh, you know, promoted if you like by that legislation so there are a lot of people who make claims whose own perception of their disability just doesn't meet the criteria. And I think it would be naive to think that the Social Security Bill can always meet the criteria of everybody who would like to come within its terms. Um, the financial uh, benefits, if you like, of, of, of meeting that conditionality are very, very significant. And obviously people may make claims that, that, that can't be allowed. And that's why I think it, it, it's not practical to say that there would be a right to make a claim because my human rights have been infringed because the social security conditionality doesn't meet what I think should be my um, human right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else wish to come in? <clears throat> Peter Kelly, do you want yeah, to come in? I think um, if we are... If we're to have principles, and if they're to have any meaning, and if we're to have a charter, and it's to have any meaning, then, then people need to understand what their ability to seek redress when, when they feel as though they haven't had those rights respected. Um, I think we have, probably all of us, a long experience of, of various charters that have been set up by public bodies that 
um, individuals either have no knowledge of or feel as though they have no ability to uh, enforce when, when levels of, of standards, uh, levels of service don't meet uh, the charter. So I think there needs to be some form in which people can seek redress with respect to the charter. John Dickey, did you want to come in on that? Yes, no, two things. I mean, I think your second panel of witnesses will have more expertise in terms of how you ensure that the principles uh, in relating to, to, to a human rights-based approach um, are actually grounded in law. Um, I think there is, it is important that, that, that they are, that this is, this is meaningful. Um, and one way of doing that is to ensure that the bill makes explicit reference to Article 9 of the um, uh, of the International Covenant on, 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 on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, um, so that, 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 that that's clearly you know, based in international law. Uh, there may be other mechanisms for doing that as well. Um, in terms of the Charter, certainly it needs to be, there needs to be some mechanism for ensuring that uh, there are clear avenues for people to take if they feel that their experience of the system isn't matching up to what the Charter sets out. Um, but I suppose I would just repeat again, I suppose our, our expertise and where I'm quite keen to get into the detail on is how these principles uh, are translated throughout the, the specific rules um, set out in the Bill for Social Security in Scotland. And that, uh, in many ways, is what's going to really make the difference as to whether people uh, are able to, um, whether people's rights to Social Security in Scotland are enhanced by this Bill. Uh, that's, that's very can. helpful. I, mean, I think other members of the committee want to ask you about exactly that, so I'll leave it there. Thank yeah. you very much. I don't know. Did you want to come in, Dr McCormick, on that particular one? OK. Uh, ben McPherson. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. I'd actually like to come back to the, the principles and have an, a number of questions based on, on, on what's been said already. The points that were raised about accessibility, that's certainly something that's come back in terms of the feedback we've received from um, current claimants. So if there's anything more you'd like to expand on on that, I'd, I'd be interested. But I think, Jessica Burns, your uh, warnings really resonated with me uh, and, and your concerns about the, the, the realism of this and that there's only a portion of powers that are, are, are being devolved as part of this legislation. And that in terms of the principles, that always needs to be uh, borne in mind. So uh, on two things, in terms of the uh, independent advocacy as a potential principle. You know, I have some remarkable advocacy uh, organisations in my constituency and I know the important work that they do. But a lot of the work that they do is based around the fact that they're dealing with the current DWP system and the lack of support that there is within that system at present, in, in my view and, and many views of others. Are we, do we need to think in a, in a nuanced way about the idea of independent advocacy within this, in terms of if we are going to think about including a principle orientated around that, does it need to be much more specific and concentrated on the specific benefits that are being devolved and are covered within this bill? And also with the, the hope and aspiration in mind that the way that this new social security system is delivered will be comprehensively different to the status quo with the DWP. So that's my first question. And my second one, um, uh, convener, if, if, you, if you don't mind, is to do with uh, similar concerns around the, the, the scope of the, the devolved powers. Um, Peter Kelly, your suggestion to include another principle that social security has a role in the eradication of poverty in Scotland. Uh, if that was a, 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 if we were, if we had a social security bill that had the full comprehensive powers of social security, I, I, I would be supportive. But while my my heart believes that uh, social security, of course, uh, in the round does have a role in tackling poverty in Scotland, absolutely, this bill can't deliver all the social security powers necessary to tackle poverty in Scotland. Um, and I think I'm just slightly concerned about your proposal because of that nuance and that uh, complexity around the, the powers that are coming. So I'd be really interested in your thoughts on, on those concerns that I have. Thank you. Um, Peter Kelly, do you want to come I'll, in first? I'll come back on your, your second point first and then maybe come back to the other one later. Um, I think you could, you could make the claim that um, the social security system in its pre-1999 state, before anything was devolved at all, um, only had a role in 
the prevention and eradication of poverty. The social security system, I'm sure John would say this and others, um, cannot tackle yeah. poverty on its own. It can't. I think when we're talking about the principles, though, for, I mean, as you said, that um, we want to set a different direction, shall we say, with, with the powers that are coming to Scotland. Um, I think if we want to, to set out what that different direction is, then we need to, to be clearer on the, the very positive role that, that Social Security and the powers that we will have, which are not insubstantial, um, can have in, in preventing some people going into poverty and in supporting people to move out of poverty as well. So I think there's, there's no, no question that um, the, the powers that, that, that the Parliament will have with respect to Social Security cannot solve poverty on their own. Social Security overall cannot solve poverty on its own. We know that uh, many of the people who are in poverty now are, are in in-work poverty. So we, we require a much broader um, approach to tackle poverty. But I think this is a recognition of the, the really critical role that Social Security plays. Um, I'd be interested in, in thoughts on my other points. Can we yes, who yeah. wants to come in? Jessica Bunch, and then <coughs> well, perhaps I should just uh, talk a little bit about representation and advocacy and what that means for people navigating quite a complex system. I, mean, I would be probably not supportive of representation and advocacy that only looked at benefits covered by the Social Security um, Scotland Bill because I think it's going to be equally important to have a holistic approach for people uh, who are claiming benefit mm -hmm. with universal credit. And at the moment, a lot of representative organisations are putting a lot of energy uh, into that aspect. So it has to be support that covers the whole benefits package that might apply to that individual and that family. Um, I think in Scotland we're um, really blessed by the fact that there is such a good availability of representation. I'm not saying it's, it's complete, and I know there are shortages in certain areas, but it's substantially greater than it is south of the border. For instance, we have more than 80% representation in tribunals in Scotland compared to about 20% uh, south of the border. And I had experience of working in Birmingham where it was almost impossible for appellants to access representation. So um, I do think that's very, very important. I think there's different levels of that, and that's a more complex issue. There's the claiming, there's the challenging, there's the going along to tribunal. <clears throat> there might be different approaches to those, but I still think it's, it's these are mostly people in poverty or with disabilities are vulnerable and they certainly feel disempowered in terms of the process and the complexity of that. I think it's part of the respect and dignity agenda that they can access that support. I, I, <coughs> don't, can I just come in one supplementary very quick. Then. Can, I guess I'm just, I'm interested in whether the view is that there should be a principle of a, a right effectively to advocacy, independent advocacy support in a bill uh, that, that's orientated on uh, the devolved benefits. But there's a, perhaps a suggestion being put forward to us that there should be a right to advocacy across the full uh, range of the social security system, an all-encompassing right uh, effectively, and whether that's appropriate in this bill is, just, is, is the question that I'm asking, and, I'm, and that nuanced uh, complexity mm. is, is, is what I'm, uh, I'm so probing. There's a very special meaning um, of providing a mouthpiece for somebody who's not confident or not able to articulate their own mm. position very clearly. Now, I think there's a bit of a conflict here because in some ways it's sometimes patronising to someone to say, <coughs> pardon me, you don't have your own voice, it has to be fed through someone else. And I, I would be a bit apprehensive if there was a suggestion that the system required someone to access advocacy um, uh, as, as widespread as you're perhaps suggesting. 
<laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually just interested in what, what other suggestions are and listening right now, so that, that's very we'll helpful. Let Thank Dr. You. McCormick wants to come in. So I, I, I think the principle of choice here is really important if, because it's so tied to um, realising the principle of dignity. So my understanding is a great deal of advocacy um, is, is quite light touch, self-arranged, so it's family and friends and neighbours, someone to come along with you, and when there is representation even at that level, um, outcomes are better in terms of success rates at appeal. Um, I think what this bill can say more about is that much more specialised, if you like, um, higher level um, independent advocacy. Um, where even if we are successful, as I'm sure and I hope we will be, in, in setting a different culture with our agency and our systems in Scotland, there will still be people who, for lots of reasons to do with language, learning disability, um, uh, mental health difficulties, traumatic experience in the past, with the best will in the world, will struggle to achieve from the system what they ought to achieve. And so I think... Um, uh, uh, the choice to be able to draw upon that kind of support um, in this context is really important. Without being starry-eyed, I mean, we have um, we have this right enshrined, enshrined through devolved mental health legislation, and we know that there is a great deal of unmet unmet demand in the system already. Um, so probably demand is rising, resources are falling. So I think we should start by looking at what's happening currently with mental health rights to advocacy and working from there to understand what kind of provision we're going to need. Um, um, I mean, I think Jessica's right that, that even if we um, embed this within the provisions of the bill and the, and the benefits that will flow, in reality, that resource will be stretched and used for other, other needs, both reserved social security and perhaps other things too, like social care. Mm -hmm. John Dickey, you want to come in? Yes, I very much echo and endorse what Jim said and say that I think we would support um, uh, you know, those, those, those that are calling for um, a right to um, independent advocacy and would be, would be very careful about that. That isn't just related to that we don't develop a system of advocacy support uh, that's purely around the devolved system. We need to look at this holistically, uh, as Jessica has said. Um, I think there's another issue in terms of um, access to independent advice and information and the potential to build something into the bill um, to, to put a duty on ministers to ensure the provision uh, of independent advice and advocacy uh, to support people uh, in accessing and challenging decisions in relation to social security, both devolved and at UK level. Um, we have currently have a system where housing advice, money advice are underpinned by uh, legislative um, backing, which means that they're to some extent protected when difficult budget decisions are being made at national and local level. There isn't any equivalent for social security benefits advice. So there's an opportunity here to um, ensure um, the, 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 a duty on ministers to, to ensure the provision of independent advice, as well as looking at the, the independent advocacy issues. These are the two kind of separate but related um, forms of support that are needed uh, in a well-functioning social security system. And I suppose that's the final point, just to echo what Jim was saying, is we don't just need advocacy or advice because of when social security systems are, are failing or not, they're actually an integral part of a well-functioning social security system that there will be people, um, for whatever reason, uh, need additional assistance to navigate the system and need uh, advocacy, whether that's formal or informal. Uh, and there's always going to be a need for independent advice to ensure that people uh, are able to understand their entitlements and can seek independent support uh, where they feel that decisions have been made uh, that, uh, that, 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 are, that are wrong. Peter Kelly, you wanted to go back in that yeah, one? Yeah, just very quickly also on advocacy. I think okay. uh, we're, we're part of the Scottish Campaign Welfare Reform. I think they've submitted very clear evidence on the importance of uh, independent advocacy. We've also had uh, representations from the Independent Advocacy Alliance as well, who, who again have reinforced the importance of, of independent ad advocacy. And I don't think anywhere have we... Have we sought to distinguish between advocacy that's, that's related specifically only to the new powers and, and other wider social security powers. Um, and I think if we, if we make the comparison to uh, benefit uptake, whilst benefit uptake campaigns may well target specific benefits, we would hope that there would be a knock-on benefit um, impact that people would understand uh, their, their entitlements to other uh, areas. 
And I think we also need to relate the, the issue of independent advocacy, I think as others have done, back to equalities issues that, that some people may be less likely to uh, be able to claim their entitlements and may need additional support. So I think on that basis as well, there's, there's an important role for, for independent ad advocacy in the system. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Convener. Thank Mark you very Griffin. much. Thanks, Convener. Uh, a question about the, the balance of legislation, but if I could just continue on the, the point of advocacy briefly. There seems to be um, a view within government, uh, gov government policy makers I think that was restated at the ministerial statement on Tuesday that um, independent advocacy is needed um, for people accessing uh, reserve benefits because the DWP are so terrible and that the new agency is going to be so um, sensitive and caring and welcoming that perhaps independent advocacy isn't as, as needed. That seems to be the, the, the view from government that I'm getting and I'm sorry if I'm misrepresenting them but do members of the panel think that is a, a view that we should guard against, um, given that regardless of how the new agency is set up, that there is a potential for a change in government, there's a potential for a change in attitude, and um, there may be a new government which comes in and um, sets a tougher assessment regime or starts to um, set targets to reduce the social security bill, that there will always be a need for independent advocacy in the system, regardless of how well the, the, the agency is set up initially. Does anyone want to come back on that one? Can I short answers? Because we we'll always get a lot, that's a lot, exactly a lot of um, trying to say people want to come in. Um, John Dickey. Access to independent advocacy um, is, is, a, is, a, is an integral part of a well-functioning social security system. It's, that system. it's not just something that's needed in a system that's not working or that's, that's failing. That there will always be people with particular vulnerabilities, with communication barriers, um, for whom the support, either informal or formal, uh, of, uh, 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 of somebody advocating um, with them and on their behalf um, is necessary to help to navigate even a well-designed, well-functioning system. Peter yeah, I mean, just, uh, Similar to John, I mean, I think independent advocacy um, goes to addressing power imbalances, and those power imbalances, you know, will exist no matter uh, what the intention behind the system is. So I think, just as John says, it's, uh, it's an important function that needs to be there. Any other panel want to come back on that particular one? Okay, Mark. Okay, thanks, Commissioner. My next question is on the balance um, of the legislation, whether um, principles are in primary, secondary or guidance. And um, Some members of the panel have, have, talk, have talked about some of the government commitments that, um, that some members yourself have worked hard to, to secure in those commitments, whether that's an uprating of benefits in line with inflation, whether that's a ban on private sector contractors, or whether that is something like income maximisation that's been mentioned already. Where do you think the, the balance lies between making sure that those um, principles that have been fought for and won, uh, where, where do you feel that they should sit in how secure do you, are, do you feel with those not being on the face of the bill? Who wants to come in first? John Dickey. Make, maybe make a more general point about the balance between um, uh, what's on the face of the bill, what's in primary legislation and what's been left to regulation and perhaps uh, even more left, left to guidance. There's no question that there is a balance to be struck um, in terms of what level of detail you put into primary legislation in relation to Social Security and what you leave to, to regulations. Um, there does need to be an element of flexibility to be able to um, uh, change regulations as, as policy changes, as people's needs change. As it stands, we don't feel the bill does get that, that balance right between what's in primary and what's been left to, to secondary legislation. Um, in big picture terms, as it stands, um, the, 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 the bill um, would enable future governments to make fundamental changes to disability and carers' assistance, for example, without the need for primary legislation. Um, potentially to create entirely new forms of assistance or to, to change fundamentally the assistance that's already in place without that uh, consultation and parliamentary scrutiny that primary legislation requires. Um, so we think more does need to be put where, where there is um, more policy developed around 
the, 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 the devolved assist types of assistance that are being devolved then put those on the face of the bill where it isn't there then further down the line as that uh, policy develops and as we have a clear idea of what we want to do with these powers then to bring forward uh, further legislation. There's also issues for individual rights uh, and, and, and people's individual rights to social security uh, that result from leaving so much to um, secondary legislation and in some cases not even making provision for secondary legislation. Um, there's issues for individuals in terms of it does mean that benefits can change at relatively short notice um, and you know, security of income uh, is, 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 is of real importance to, to, to people. Um, and the idea that those benefits could be fundamentally changed without uh, adequate scrutiny, consultation, period of time to consider that uh, is, is, is worrying. Um, but there's also an issue in terms of people not having um, that level of primary legislation to refer to in terms of being able to uh, challenge decisions uh, if, if things don't go wrong. I mean, so in relation to the types of assistance, as I say, um, where, where there is policy developed, for example, around Best Start grants, let's see more of that policy on, on the face of the bill. Um, where it hasn't been developed, let's ensure that further uh, primary legislation is brought forward in due course. Um, but it might also be helpful to um, talk in terms of, uh, in relation to the administration of uh, devolved assistance, um, and to give maybe a couple of examples where we think that... Um, leaving so much out of primary legislation has the, is actually going to reduce, if it's left as it is, would reduce people's rights rather than enhance them uh, under, the, uh, uh, under the, the, the new system. And clearly that's not the policy intent. So I think this is about making sure that the bill, uh, as it's drafted and well, after, as it's worded and as it's been introduced, uh, matches the, the, the policy intent of government. So the first example, uh, perhaps helpful to give in terms of it. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Dickey. Uh, obviously, we've got other questions on our panels. Could maybe, maybe okay. Well, very Thank quickly, you. maybe people can come back to it. The first example was relating to, to applications, for example. So the bill says um, that the applications for assistance have been made to be made in a way that ministers require, um, and these will be publicised. Um, the problem is there can be disputes about whether an application has been made valid. We see validly, we see that in the current system, um, and without anything in regulation, without any provision to make regulations as to what a valid application is, there'll be no grounds for people to be able to uh, challenge a decision about whether a, an application has been made valid, validly. That can cause delay in people's payments, cause a loss, a loss of money. So there's, a, there's an issue here about making sure more is in the, that there's provision made to ensure that there's regulations in place that actually set out what would be a valid application. The other example would be around um, recovery of overpayments. Um, so we, as the bill stands at the moment, um, overpayments can be recovered. Well, I mean, I suppose the thing to say is, is there are always situations where, um, as a result of individual error or agency error, um, overpayments uh, are made, and it's reasonable to set out where, where those um, can be recoverable. But that needs to be done in a way that doesn't cause hardship. Uh, and as, as it stands in this bill, there's no power to make regulations on what circumstances it would or would not be uh, reasonable to, um, re to recover over permits or um, no power to set maximum deductions that could be made to future to, to, to benefits uh, to, to make that recovery. Um, so that again means that without any regulations, without any, anything in legislation, there's no grounds to appeal those decisions, uh, le potentially leaving people in very real hardship because we've left so much to uh, discretion uh, and to guidance. Okay, is it, sorry, is it Dr McCormick, did you want to come in? Well, I, I think the, the examples of right to cash or alternative assistance and overpayments are two very, very good examples of, of looking at where the balance is not right. Um, but, but broadly, I think the question, so how we answer this question on the, on the balance depends on at least two parts of the system, two moving parts where we don't yet know what's going to be uh, put in place. One is the charter. So how robust, how enforceable is the, is the charter going to be? The other is scrutiny. How much assurance can we take from whatever scrutiny arrangements we put in place to look at um, uh, secondary legislation and guidance? Um, will that be independent? Um, you heard a lot about this last week from Professor McKeever, mm -hmm. um, uh, the need for you know, revisions and, and, and independent scrutiny. So 
answering your question, I think, depends on understanding where the bill sits with these other, these other parts of the jigsaw. But I think John's absolutely right with the examples he's chosen. Jessica Burns, you want to come in? Uh, uh, no, exactly. Okay. Uh, Peter Keller, do you want to come back on that one? Just very briefly, um, because I, again, I would just echo John's uh, response already. I think in terms, you, you mentioned uprating, and I think that's, that's very clearly um, something that's missing from, from the bill as is at the moment. Uh, it goes to the issue of adequacy, which again comes back to the principle of um, how is this, um, these, these new powers going to be used to, to address poverty. So I think something around, um, around the uprating mechanism for, for benefits would be really important to, to be in there as well. But I think I, I would echo just the comments already in terms of the balance. The balance is too much towards uh, regulations. Did you want to come back in? No, thanks, Kevin. Okay. Uh, Ruth Maguire, you wanted to come in? Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit about scrutiny. Um, what role you would see the um, our elected Scottish Parliament playing in the scrutiny? Um, do you have a model in mind that you want to see? And I suppose, um, going back to that bit where we're only having part of the benefit system come here, are there any international examples of, of scrutiny of, of best practice that we could learn from or follow? Dr McCormick, I know you're an expert in, in this well. particular field. <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly, certainly an expert group anyway, so Dr McCormick. So, so just to say a word where I hope we'll, we'll be maybe by the end of the calendar year, so you'll know that the Minister for Social Security has asked the advisory group that I chair to establish a short life work stream um, to look into scrutiny. So th there will be a process, but not yet an answer. Um, uh, our intention is that that work stream um, will um, engage with yourselves and with the, let me try and get this right, the Public Audit and Post Legislative Scrutiny Committee. Uh, I think uh, those are the two appropriate places at this stage to position the parliamentary uh, engagement around that. Um, you'll also know um, that, that a role for the existing UK scrutiny bodies covering the bulk of Social Security but also industrial injuries benefit. Both of those are important bodies. A role for them has been ruled out by the Scotland Act. So um, the, 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 there's, the, there's absolutely a question to answer in Scotland. What do we want to put into that place? Bearing in mind that a lot of the um, uh, second reg secondary regulations and the guidance will be of a complex and quite technical nature, bearing in mind this is substantially startup activity. Um, uh, uh, as an example, in the last year, SAC looked at 44 regulations, most of which were um, of a technical nature. Um, uh, we don't have a revising chamber in Scotland. So I, I think, in principle, it's only a personal view. It wouldn't be the work stream's view yet. I think, in principle, there's a very strong case for having an independent body. Um, it may be constituted differently from SAC because that was set up over 30 years ago. It would need to have a different relationship with Parliament than is true at Westminster. Um, and there would need to be a, a kind of, kind of thorough, thorough look at what kind of functions that should take on. Um, but I think there's a very strong case for um, quite quickly beefing up what should be in that uh, scrutiny space uh, alongside but separate from Parliament. Thank you very much. Can you know international examples of this, this kind of setup where a devolved administration has a section of, of a system? Uh, hopefully. Um, we will be able to do a bit of digging around that. The, 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 the places we would start to look at, I think most helpfully would be, as an example, would be Canada, possibly Belgium, possibly Switzerland. Um, um, what, we, what we'll find from those comparative examples, I don't know, because I I'm, I'm genuinely don't have expertise in, at this point in, in what those lessons will tell us, but I think now is the time to look in a bit of depth and also look outwards at what we can learn and do it quite quickly. Sure. Anyone else want to come in? Sorry, John Dickey, did you want to come in? Uh, echo everything that Jim said, and we really do believe it is vital that there is some form of independent expert 
uh, statutory scrutiny of uh, devolved um, social security regulations, um, that, that, plays a, that that will play a role that complements the role of Parliament and the importance of Parliament uh, continuing to play its role in terms of democratic accountability and, 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 uh, and, and scrutiny of regulations. But there's something about that kind of expert, independent, non-politically aligned um, role that in large part is played at the moment in UK Social Security by the Social Security Advisory Committee. So I think it is important that we, we take elements of that uh, and ensure that we have similarly robust statutory uh, scrutiny uh, in place here, here in Scotland as well. And I'm afraid I don't, yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what comes out of the looking at internationally, what the international comparisons are, about how that, uh, how, what you put in place to, 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 to deal with that kind of relationship between devolved uh, and, and, and UK social security. But there is a, there's an issue, there is a, there's a, there, there's, there's, there's a need there for something to look at how UK social security will interact with devolved social security as well. Mm. Did you want to come in, Peter Kelly? Um, just briefly, we mentioned this in our, our evidence to the committee. Um, again, we've, we've had a, a long-standing um, proposal that there should be some form of uh, scrutiny similar to um, the uh, Social Security Advisory Committee. I think I, I would uh, echo John and, and Jim's comments about the, the precise nature of that. Um, I think that there is... There's obviously there's clearly a role for the Parliament, and, and any uh, independent scrutiny in the, at the Scottish level would need to complement what the Parliament's doing. Um, we we are also in a in a period where we we are moving towards a, a poverty and inequality commission that, that that will have some kind of statutory basis, perhaps, it's a bit unclear at the moment. Um, there could be an overview that um, the, the new commission could have with respect to social security as well, that, that perhaps. So I think it's, that's a little bit unclear, but I think there may be a role there. Okay, Dr. McCormick, you want to go back in? Really briefly, just to link back to our previous question, it really does underline the importance of having the appropriate um, amount of... Um, scrutiny at the primary stage. It makes the case for uh, this committee and the whole parliament being able to scrutinise as much of the primary intent as possible, while also recognising there is a time scale here. There's a need to get going. We saw this week announcements about the agency. So, it's, so this really is about, about getting... A lot of skill will be involved in getting the right balance between a, a, a safe and, and long-standing, far-sighted bill but also ensuring there's enough at the primary scrutiny stage to not leave an unfair or unsafe burden to um, scrutiny outside the parliament down the line. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. There. Jeremy Balfour. Thank you very much for all four individuals. Um, some of what I was going to ask around um, how much should be my bill has already been covered, so I'll leave that for um, another day. Uh, my question is, I think, is aimed at um, Jessica Burns, and I should just declare again that I sat on tribunals for 20 years. So, uh, um, but I think what has been interesting for us is we hear that over 60% of cases that go to tribunals, PIP tribunals, are successful. And I suppose the question behind that is, is that because DWP are getting it so wrong or the tribunals are getting it so right? So why are so many people successful in regards to that, as someone who's done a lot of these, perhaps you'd be interested to get your views. The other area that we are, we've been asked to look at is what is the best evidence for someone to get an award or not get an award? And again, you will have a lot of experience in regard to uh, GP records, other professionals, medical evidence. And I suppose from your perspective, what is the best evidence um, out with a claimant that would help you reach the best decision possible and do we need to look at doing that differently than we do that at the moment and my final question very briefly and it's a bit of a an imbism question but it has um going forward the tribunal makeup of a pip is different of that for eis it's, and i just want yes sorry and i wonder do you think we should still keep the three person tribunal or is it better to just go down to have a lawyer and a doctor? 
apologies for those questions within that, uh, embodied in that one question. I mean, just going back to why so many um, appeals are successful, uh, I mean, there are elements of success, as you know, because there are different um, grades or d different awards you can get for PIP. So not everyone's entirely satisfied, even where their appeal is allowed. Um, but essentially what you're looking at is a snapshot of the healthcare professional on a particular day with a particular person and their assessment of their abilities on that day. Whereas I think the tribunal are looking at um, really what the person is like over a longer period, even if you're looking at one date of decision. Um, it's very uh, functionally based, and a lot of people with mental health problems, uh, I think, find it very difficult to convey those problems to healthcare professionals who may not have any expertise in that particular area. I think this has been quite well documented. Um, I don't know that tribunals always get it right, because you have to say this is a very, very complex area. And the number of uh, appeals that, that come, they're very, very finely balanced. And I think tribunals are very conscious of the fact that the implications for someone who isn't successful at appeal financially can be quite devastating. Um, as I think you're aware, we do get letters from GPs expressing concern, perhaps not so much about the... the um, health of the individual, but the impact of the loss of that income to the household and the added stress that, 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 that w w would follow. And indeed, um, a, a lot of people we see have been quite um, traumatised by the loss of their transport, their ability to interact with other people, their ability to pay their bills because they got used to that additional income. And you're talking about awards up to about £600 a month, which are tax-free. And to go from that kind of benefit to nothing, you can imagine how devastating that is for the individual. So, um, you know, sometimes the process itself can impact on the mental health of the people involved. And there's a very complex association between mental and physical disabilities as well that, 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 that impact too. Looking to the evidence that, that we get, um, as I think you're aware, quite often the tribunals adjourn or preview cases and decide that it would be a good idea to get medical case notes, perhaps for the last mm -hmm. year or two years, just to get um, some primary evidence about the diagnoses, the treatment, the reasonable range of expectation that you would have around that. And it's one way of perhaps um, assessing how reliable the individual's own perception is of their condition. We very rarely now ask the GP to write a report to say, basically, do you think somebody meets that criteria? Because we know that it can be very, um, uh, well, it can impact on the um, patient-doctor relationship and I am aware that there might be difficulties around involving GPs mm. more in that assessment process. But I do understand that there are ways of getting an extract of GP computer records, which might actually set a baseline for somebody's entitlement, which might mean that it's not necessary to call them in for any face-to-face -face assessment. But ultimately, it will depend on the secondary legislation and what kind of criteria are applied. Because sometimes, in terms of someone's function, you can't um, uh, make a direct correlation between their contact with their GP and their treatment and their loss of function. Some people, particularly... Um, uh, with drug abuse, um, alcohol abuse issues, mental health. They may not want to engage with their GP, they may not feel able to engage with their GP, and they become very heavily dependent on support from family, which might not be reflected in medical records. Um, it's such a complex area that really I, I would like to see 
perhaps um, some more um, research, factual base um, information coming before uh, the Parliament, at least at the stage of the secondary um, legislation and the, the regulations that could um, perhaps uh, capture some of those issues a bit more accurately. Thank, thank you very, thank very you. much for that. Anyone else in the panel want to come back on that particular one before I bring in Polly McNeil? Just, Just to, to add, I suppose the best way to reduce the number of appeals that are being made is to get more of the decision making right mm -hmm. from, from the start. And um, we certainly urge, given there's a creation of a new agency, potential to create a whole new culture and a whole new approach to uh, evidence gathering and decision making, that uh, the new agency decision maker takes a more proactive and inquisitorial approach to gathering evidence and that decision, maker, decision makers are able to make decisions based on the evidence that they do have mm -hmm. uh, rather than ruling applications out because of evidence that they don't have. Um, so a more proactive, positive approach to gathering evidence and then being able to make decisions based on the evidence that they have gathered, uh, I think, go a long way to um, ensuring that uh, decisions are made better decision making is made in the first place because I do think in the vast majority of cases the best evidence is from the claimant and most claimants are reliable in the evidence that they give but not entirely so and the credibility of any system I think has to recognize that sometimes um, that statements that individuals make may not be, um, you know, in, in entirely correct. Yeah. If we could just pick up on that particular point about statements and even the appearance of claimants when they're going forward. We certainly heard evidence from, from roundtable discussions, uh, basically notes from when they went to appeal or before they went to appeal that they're looking well, they dress well, they look after themselves, mm -hmm. so therefore they're not ill <clears throat> in that respect. And this is what people have been facing. So I think it's really important, as John has said, that we get it right from yes. the very beginning uh, to make sure these claimants are looked at properly. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if, does anybody else want to come in before I bring in Polly McNeil? Just what Dr. Just, just, just really, really briefly, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's self-evident that getting this part of the system right, have, having the best possible approach to assessment is probably the single biggest challenge facing any social security system, actually, and certainly for us in Scotland. Um, I think it's important that we don't um, mix together um, illness and disability. Sometimes they overlap, but often they're quite distinct. And drawing upon a medical approach, GP records or others, allied health professionals or mm -hmm. specialist nurses, may work well for the bulk of people with long-term conditions, you know, stable or fluctuating, but it certainly isn't going to work well for lots of people with other disabilities mental and physical. And so I think we have to understand the limitations as well as the importance of, for example, GP records and make sure we are building our system from self-assessment evidence, other routine evidence that's in the system already that we can just do a better job of sharing with mm -hmm. patient consent, for example, um, and then asking what else is needed um, and build it up from in that way. Thank you. Sorry, you, could, I, could, I just yes. come back, could I just come back on one issue? Mm -hmm. And that is, um, I think, a real challenge in the system is people who dip in and out of qualifying for the benefits. Those transitions are extremely difficult because it's almost a disincentive for somebody to um, ever acknowledge that there's been an improvement in their condition because mm. they might be locked in to that, um, the dependence on that benefit. And it can be very, you know, personally, um, it, it, it would represent quite, quite a reduction in their standard of living um, if they were to lose that benefit. And I know that one of some of the submissions on that did look again at the introduction of a lower level of um, daily living component in, in purpose, acknowledging that perhaps it's just too broad brush when you look at PIP um, and what the Scottish Government could perhaps consider um, making something more graded and also if a benefit was to end having a tapering so it wasn't just suddenly falling off a cliff and people would have the opportunity to adjust to that lower income and I think that would go some way 
to taking some of the pain away from um, someone whose condition had palpably improved. Thank you. <clears throat> John Dickey, do you want to give a short one there? Or, oh, sorry, Peter Kelly. Okay. Polly Meeting. Good morning. Uh, firstly, apologies to the panel for being late. Um, I'm interested to further explore um, what should be in the primary legislation in relation to supporting the claimant. Um, so we've discussed a framework which would be based on uh, dignity and uh, human rights. Um, secondly, of course, there's the question of the people who administer the system and they're the face-to-face -face, um, front line of the agency. Um, I wondered if, firstly, the panel thought um, that there should be a duty in the primary legislation of all officials representing ministers to ensure that they are in, uh, maximising all benefits and beyond benefits in terms of what support could be given to, to the claimants, uh, whether that might be a duty that could be enforced in law. Um, and lastly, um, so a continuation of Ben McPherson's question about advocacy. It seems to me the committee are going to have to spend a bit of time thinking about this and what it really means. So, as the panel rightly pointed out, um, you know, it, it's a specific measure for people who may have specific um, issues that they need a professional advocate for. And I think perhaps there needs to be a distinction between that and people who just ordinarily need a bit of support. Um, so, I, I, I thought that Se separately from the question of advocacy is the right to have someone accompany you throughout the process, support you through the process. So even if you don't have a language barrier or a disability barrier, um, it's such a daunting process to go through. It seemed to me, to get it right, that pretty much all of this um, would be helpful to have in the primary legislation. I wondered what you thought. Who wants to kick off first? Jessica Burns, I'm coming. Well, I, I think that... <clears throat> it's up to the, the choice of the individual. When you say there's a right to have someone support you, it's not something that's excluded at the moment. And it might give people the sense that they really ought to have somebody else with them. Um, I mean, it's something that I think could be incorporated in the literature that, that enables people to access the system. But, you know, some people ultimately want to deal with that process on their own, and I think you have to respect that right as well. They feel they're dealing with very personal issues that they don't necessarily want to share, even with family. They might want to protect them for all sorts of reasons, and they find it just easier, however difficult it is, to, to access that themselves. Um, in terms of the other issue that you raised about the right uh, or the obligation of any social security agency um, to ensure that that person's entitlement's been maximised. Um, uh, I'm not sure how um, enforceable that could be, but one thing I have jotted down is the issue of backdating. Um, it used to be quite well enshrined in social security that if there was a good reason that someone hadn't made a claim earlier, then it could be looked at to see if that should have been backdated. And it might well be that some consideration should be given to that in um, you know, explicit circumstances. And that would possibly ameliorate hardships of people who've been totally unaware of the benefit um, and then caught up with it at some later stage. I know it's difficult with retrospective assessments, but sometimes it's a very straightforward issue. Thank you. Um, Dr McCormick, did you want to come in? So just to draw a distinction with the current system, we know that um, within DWP services, there is some good, some bad, and some ugly stuff happening. You can go to this one part of Scotland and find in neighbouring job centres very different operational approaches to whether someone can cross the threshold with you in that office. Um, so I think one thing we can change, um, both with the new agency, its premises and its workforce, but also with co-location arrangements, which might be in local government or housing offices or the NHS, um, you know, a, a welcoming of people arranging their own support if they can do that. That's the choice they can and want to make. 
um, and an absolute sharing of information about what people can do before they cross the threshold if they need to access support, even if that's informal support, or indeed more formalised advocacy. I think that cultural signal that we welcome you to bring support because we want to get it right first time. The system is then taking responsibility and it's like bearing some of the responsibility of trying to get it right first time and, and achieve good decision making upstream rather than leaving things to appeals and complaints and whatnot. So um, I, I'm not sure what that looks like in terms of a duty for the agency and the workforce, but I certainly am clear that um, uh, we can we can ensure people feel they are embarking upon a journey, whether they're successful or not in the end, that the experience will be a much higher quality one. Thank you. Peter Kelly. I, mean, I think we've, uh, Jim used that phrase, a cultural signal. I think there's no sort of clearer signal than to have um, that right in the face of the bill to, to be accompanied. And we've, we've already discussed uh, advocacy, and I think it is linked. Um, I would expect, you know, if if the bill has principles of uh, dignity and respect, then throughout the the guidance that will eventually come and throughout the, the operational um, procedures for the new agency, we would want to see those principles reflected. But I think there's no greater signal than having it uh, on the face of the bill. And I th the, the other um, issue that you raised was around um, ensuring that benefits are maximised. I think we'd, we'd called for um, the principle around having a role to play in ensuring um, that everyone had their full entitlement to a duty. And I think that, that duty then um, made real would be about ensuring that everyone had, had access to their, their full entitlement. Mm -hmm. John Dickey, do you want to go in? Yeah, just I think endorse both what Jim and Peter ha have said. Um, a duty ensure, to ensure people uh, are given the social security assistance they're eligible for as one of the principles, uh, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and then I suppose coming back to the other point I made earlier on that the potential for a duty um, on ministers to uh, produce, have to produce uh, and review and report on a strategy for um, maximising take up um, and, and reducing underclaiming of benefits would also help to ensure there's a real focus on making sure people are getting the financial mm -hmm. support they're entitled to and that the system's reviewing and looking at why that's not happen happening uh, and reporting on that uh, and then taking action to uh, improve access uh, and improve take up. Thank you. Just one other quick question, um, just in relation to the issue of overpayments. Um, just very quickly, do you think the committee need to do a bit, little bit more work on this in terms of what the principle should be? So, for, for example, um, in some of the sessions that we've done, the question was asked, well, if the, the claimant was wrongly assessed and it wasn't their fault. Um, it seems to be a view that the bill, or should, or is, uh, they would not claw back the overpayment, and I just wondered um, if you had any thoughts you can share with the committee about whether there needs to be more work around this question. Dr McCormick. So I don't want to repeat what John said, because I think he was right, but I think, I think the answer is yes. Um, I think uh, the bill feels like it's based on quite similar terms to the way in which HMRC operates tax credits and specifically overpayments there, which has recourse to guidance rather than statute. It means, as was said, um, uh, there's a lot of discretion, there's a lot of variability across the country in what happens. Um, and th th this is distinct from points that might be made in the bill around fraud and error. Uh, I mean, error is overlaps here, but um, overpayments due to inaccurate assessment on, by the agency for example, um, the points about incentives for good decision making upstream. Uh, I think it's really important that we have a fuller appraisal of the options around how this should be dealt with, both to minimise and then deal with differently than currently tax credits would be dealt with. Is 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 you know one of the highest priorities I think for rev for revision in, in the bill as it stands. Thank you. Quickly, sorry, John Dickey. 
do you want to come in first? Or you know, just to echo that, and again, I don't want to repeat what I said earlier, but I suppose just to flag up, this is a, a sort of key example of where the policy intent and what the policy memorandum and ministers have said isn't matched by the actual detail of what's, what the, the legislation says. So the, the, it have been clearly stated the policy intent is not to recover overpayments um, where that's uh, the result of agency error, apart from particular circumstances. There's, there's nothing in the bill that prevents that. Um, the, the bill uh, enables automatic recovery of overpayments, whatever, without creating any provision for actually setting out in what circumstances that would be reasonable to recover overpayment or how that over or, or how that overpayment might be recovered. Did you want to come in on that one, Mr. Or Spence? Well, all, all I would say is I think the issue about the duty to notify of a change of circumstance and the offence of failing to notify in terms of people with disabilities or, or, or disabling illnesses, that that recovery period, it's very difficult sometimes for the individual to say at what point they have crossed back over the threshold to not qualifying for the benefit. It's quite an intimidating issue for them, I think. Also people that have had very severe um, uh, mental health problems who then recover and they feel, well, am I defrauding the system because I haven't told someone? It, 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 it's a, I think it's a very sort of stressful um, period for someone in that position. And I, I was slightly surprised about the offence of failing to notify, um, you know, potentially resulting in a, a, a criminal um, approach. Um, I, I think this is something that could be looked at again uh, to create perhaps a more supportive um, system whereby people are invited to resubmit um, under circum circumstances, but told that if they do so, again, there might, would be a taper to their entitlement to the benefit. Thank you. Alison Johnson, you want to come in? Yeah, um, earlier there was discussion about the balance between primary and secondary legislation, and I suppose I think this, this future-proofing future is a, a concern to, to myself and many others who have been in touch. And you know, a, a good example of when this goes wrong, I believe, is the way the UK government changed the rules around PIP assessments um, because it didn't particularly welcome the ruling of a tribunal. And, you know, if this bill is going to work well into the future, I think it has to address adequacy. And I think Peter Kelly in particular touched upon the issue of uprating. And just for clarity, um, I'd like to understand if, you know, in particular John Dickey, Peter Kelly and, and Dr McCormack think that an uprating mechanism should be on the face of the bill. So it's something that can't be so easily, you know, pushed aside in the future. Okay. John Dickey. Uh, yes, there should be provision for annual uprating of the, the devolved uh, types of assistance. Um, the actual mechanism for how that uprating might work might be left to regulation, but there should be on the face of the bill uh, provision for annual uprating. Okay. I mean, in relation to disability and carers' uh, benefits currently, mm -hmm. uh, that is in, in, in primary legislation, there is annual uprating unless government did something to change the law to, to, to stop that happening. That's protected disability and carers' benefits yeah. in a way that other forms of uh, other benefits haven't been protected over the last uh, uh, few years. Um, so it's actually a really important thing to ensure that there is that so annual uprating. You'd like to see that apply to all benefits, because obviously we've seen what's happened to child benefit. It's, it's yes, I, mean, I suppose in terms of this, this bill, the key uh -huh. thing is to ensure it applies to those types of assistance that are set out in the bill as being devolved and covered by this bit of legislation to okay. ensure that there is annual provision for annual operating. Thank you. Peter Kelly, the and then Dr McCormick. Yeah, I, I echo John's points. We would like to see it on the face of the bill. I think the, the evidence is very clear that um, when we don't have um, processes for annual operating, then uh, the value of benefits falls behind. And we've seen that over the course of 20, 30 years with um, Job Seekers Allowance, where the value in relation to, to average earnings has declined year on year. Um, further ensuring that people find it difficult to work themselves out of poverty or, or, and just to get by on those benefits. So I think it's it's important that it's there in the face of the bill. Yeah. Thank you. 
Dr McCormick. I think there are three tests that come together for us with this bill. Mm -hmm. So one is about take up, which we've talked about. Um, one is about uprating, and I agree with what's been said. And if you consider that the cluster of benefits coming to Scotland um, are, are taken up by population groups with typically much lower employment rates and with higher costs, it's even more important that we are very clear about a commitment to uprating. The third point is about adequacy, which I think is separate from uprating, because mm -hmm. even with not rating, uh, we know, for example, that um, uh, especially older people with complex disabilities are, are supported in a very inadequate way by the current benefit system compared to the costs they face. Um, uh, you can make a similar case for some people who live in very remote and rural areas. Mm -hmm. So adequacy is a longer term issue, mm -hmm. which I think is best dealt with through um, the, the, the pledges that parties make, through the, the committees and through the parliament and through debate with the public. So I think there's also a really interesting, a really important rather public interest issue here, a public stake. So it's great that the experience panels will be trying to in collaboration, design and improve over time the system. But there's a risk that we're all dancing in the middle of the ice here and we're not taking the public with us on these issues. So it's really important also we have that long-term debate about adequacy and about, as Peter said, what is the contribution of social security in Scotland and the UK to a more adequate living standard for the whole population. That, so there are three points that need to be dealt with by. I agree with your question. I, I think it ought to be clearly enshrined in primary legislation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. To follow up Jim's point, I think it's, it's really important to, to make that distinction between annual uprating and a process and a mechanism for doing that and adequacy. Um, Jim's organisation has been at the forefront of developing um, methodology around trying to understand what we mean by adequacy and I think we do need to move towards uh, looking at how we implement things around the minimum income standard. We've seen it in relation to um, the living wage, which is based on the minimum income standard. So it's possible to start uh, moving and, and shifting the, the discussion in terms of debate. I would maybe link this back. Um, if we can't have um, something in the face of the bill that discusses adequacy, then perhaps we link it back to that issue of scrutiny. Uh, and this goes beyond the kind of technical scrutiny that, that both uh, uh, Jim and John uh, were talking about and maybe to that, that broader scrutiny around the, the overall impact of our, our new powers around social security, which is perhaps within the domain of the, the Poverty and Inequality Commission. So just trying to link those things together. Okay. Could, could I ask one more question? Oh, just, um, quick question. just very quickly, uh, you know, one area that we haven't really discussed this morning is mandatory reconsideration. And, you know, I think um, many of the submissions the committee have received refer to this process. Um, I, I just wonder if, if your view is that the system of appeals um, laid out in the bill differs markedly from the UK process. You know, I appreciate that there are improvements there around, you know, you will still consider, cons you, you will still receive benefits when you're appealing. Um, and, and there's the, the time limit difference too, but is it different enough? Could we have short answers? Yeah, because we are there are differences. I suppose there is there is a, a, a very real concern that, in a very important respect, um, the redetermination process set out in the bill recreates one of the key barriers to independent appeal that exists within mandatory reconsideration, and that's really the requirement to make two applications to apply in the first instance for redetermination, and then if it, that's not an internal redetermination by the agency, if that's then not successful, to then have to make another application in order for your, uh, to, in order to go to independent appeal. So our key thing, and we've, we've proposed a mechanism for doing that, is just to remove that second, that second barrier, that second gateway, that second requirement for, for another application. It's at that point that we've seen so many people fall away and a real reduction in people accessing independent appeals. So removing that barrier, ensuring people still have a choice to withdraw from the process if they're satisfied that their case has been looked into, but not requiring an additional uh, application, an additional hurdle to overcome in order to reach that uh, independent appeal. Again, just very briefly to echo John's points. Um, you asked, is it markedly different? It is different, but I think in the important uh, respect that, that John's um, highlighted, 
it's not sufficiently different and it does um, uh, repeat some of the problems that, that currently exist. And I think it, it goes to some of the questions that we've discussed this morning. Is it the policy intent? And then it's not, I don't think, um, to, to deny people access to justice in that way. Um, so I think it is an issue that, that does need to be considered again, looked at again. Jessica Bunge wanted to come in on that Just one. briefly, um, mandatory reconsideration, the mandatory and the mandatory redetermination aspect should be taken away. I think people could have an option of asking the agency to think again about the decision, but it shouldn't prevent them making a direct appeal. There would be nothing to prevent the agency revising their decision in the period before the appeal was actually heard. Quite a number of appeals do lapse. I mean, not as many as you might imagine, but the, at any point, DWP can make a decision in favour of the appellant, and that appeal doesn't go ahead. So, in some ways, it would just impose another month of waiting time before someone gets a, a, a decision. Sorry. Sorry, um, I've got two subs for that one, and that has to be the last, because we are running pretty much over time. And we have another panel who very patiently waited there. Uh, Adam Tomkins, do you want a quick sub? And I think Ruth, you wanted a quick sub. Very quick question for me, and thank you, Gavina, for squeezing me in. Um, there's a um, provision in the bill, um, bespoke provision in the bill, about the power to provide for top-ups, Section 45, but there's no provision in the bill that enables the Scottish Government to create new benefits, should there be. Straight yes or no? <laughs> if, that's, if that's okay. And if you haven't got time to answer that fully, then perhaps if you could come back to us in writing about that, because I think, I mean, we, yes. we are out of time, but I think it is an important question. You know, the power, to create for, the, power, the power to create new benefits is an important part of the devolved social security system. There's no provision for that in the bill. And, I, and I, we've been talking about emissions from the bill, and I wonder if you think that that's a significant emission, and if it is a significant emission, whether we should do something about it. That's probably too long a question for you to answer in 30 seconds. Yes. But, so if you, if you can't answer it in 30 <laughs> seconds, then perhaps if you would, wouldn't mind writing to us about it. That would be really helpful. Is, is that agreeable to the witnesses? You'll, you'll come back to us in, in writing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Ruth, you wanted to raise quick as I can. Answer. Is there a danger that if we remove the opportunity for the agency to sort something that's gone wrong, that it actually delays things for claimants? I was interested in, in what Jessica said in terms of it not necessarily being mandatory but optional. Because obviously, what, what we're interested in is folk getting money they're entitled to, and if it has to go straight to a formal tribunal, can that just delay things? I don't think anyone's suggesting it should. Well, uh, th 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 there should always be the option, and the, the, there's nothing to stop the agency from undertaking internal uh, redetermination, looking at the claim and changing its decision. And that should always be, sh there should be nothing to prevent that happening. And that's, that's, that's right that that's a part of the system and that ideally that's where things get sorted. But neither should there be any barrier or additional hurdle that if that doesn't sort the issue out, people then have to make another application, another hurdle in order to reach independent appeal. Uh, Peter? And just echoing again what John said. So no need to Thank you. It. Dr McCormick? Just what, what, I mean, wherever we get to with this, this part of the system, I think what's really important is that people are crystal clear on what's expected of them in terms of timescales, but also what they can expect from the agency. Currently, we have very strict uh, requirements around a lodging and MR. Mm -hmm. um, but... It's a black box as to when you will hear. Uh, no similar commitment from government to uh, conclude. So I think we have to have a two-way street because I think that's part of a dignified culture. If we're going to have expectations, responsibilities one way, it has to be two ways. Thank you. Jessica Burns, did you want to... I don't Very. think there's anything I can add. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. And uh, thank the, the panel. I know that I was hoping to ask... Uh, Dr. McCormick, more about uh, you know scrutiny, etc. But you have certainly answered some of what what we're going to ask. So I just want to thank you very much, and we will be speaking to yourself and your group in the future, uh, Dr. McCormick, to explore the scrutiny more. So can I just thank the witnesses, uh, and uh, we move on to our next set of witnesses. So we'll suspend for a minute till the next set of witnesses. Thank you very much.
Can I just uh, welcome the second panel of witnesses and thank you so much for your patience. I think this committee has complained on numerous occasions that a Thursday morning is not ideal for this committee to be meeting. And uh, I think uh, general agreement is we will raise it again with the presiding officer in, in, that, in that respect. Can I welcome the, the panel of witnesses? Jatin Harrier, Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, Chris Oswald, Equality and Human Rights Commission, Emma Rich and Gender, and Judith Robertson, uh, Scottish Human Rights Commission. I will start with the same question that I asked previously, uh, which is what are your thoughts on including principles in the bill and the seven principles set out and intended to underpin the new social security system? So if anyone wants to start off first, please just give us a nod. Emma, did you want to start off first? Me too. Okay, yeah. Emma. Um, thanks very much, committee, for um, inviting me and Engenda to speak to you this morning. Um, I think if we zoom out um, to the question of what's happened to women in Scotland as a result of social security changes, I think we see the need to consider gender at all stages when we are considering in Scotland what to do with these new powers that have come to us. Um, like some of the witnesses from the previous panel, Engenda advocated through the Smith Commission process for the devolution of social security powers to Scotland, and we've been very pleased to be involved in the last few years uh, in discussions about what that then should look like. Um, but I think that some uh, of the unintended consequences of failing to consider gender have really been seen in what's happened with uh, welfare reform. And the last time I was uh, in front of this committee, it was to talk about the family cap and rape clause, which I think were perhaps some of the most acute uh, failures to think about gender um, that were evident within the social security system. So our broad point has always been that it's vital to consider gender and women's different experience of social security. One in 10 Scots is a poor woman and so the experiences of, that are different between women and men are vital when we think about how best to use these powers. And so we very much welcome the commitment to a human rights-based approach, um, to the broad principles, um, endorsing dignity and respect that are on the face of this bill. What we have pointed out is that the principle of non-discrimination and equality between women and men is incorporated in the human rights rights instrument that talks most about social security, and that's the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights. And so we would make the case that the principles should be amended to include that principle of non-discrimination and equality, because as others have pointed out, the enabling framework nature of the Social Security Scotland Bill means that so much of this will come into being through regulation. And we have unfortunately seen uh, the consequences of having primary legislation that does not explicitly refer to gender equality uh, and then um, a some, somewhat failure to pick up gender in regulation and strategy. And I'd give an example of that as the trafficking bill, um, which obviously has enormous relevance to women and, and women's equality. Um, so I'd urge the committee to consider that uh, from our conversations with the minister, I think there has been a receptivity to that point that incorporating the principle of non-discrimination and equality would give effect to the ambition uh, that this bill have a human rights-based approach. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Harry? Yeah, just to uh, follow up on that, um, and thank you for inviting me as well. Um, we, we're also in support of having a specific principle on equality. Uh, we, we know, unless it's mentioned in, in your face, there, you know, right, right there in, uh, in front of you, equality is usually forgotten about or mm -hmm. um, other things take over. So we, we're certainly totally in favour of having a specific principle on equality. Um, we, for a new agency and for a new system, unless it's right there up front, uh, we know it'll get ignored, other things will take over. So we hope that the committee would support having equality as a key principle. Thank you very much. Judith Robertson, do you want to come in and then? Chris? So we welcome the ambition of the government, um, particularly in stating that social security is a human right um, and essential to the realisation of other human rights. I think that's a really important point. 
Um, and, the, and also the Scottish Government's stated ambition to take a rights-based approach to Social Security are all welcome commitments from the Government. Um, there are, however, areas where we think that that could be strengthened significantly within the Bill. Um, the, we see the value of the principles fundamentally as reframing the way Social Security is viewed in Scottish public life and underpinning the Charter. So they have a fundamental value in, 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 in setting the terms of the debate very differently. However, they do not create standalone rights and they cannot be directly enforced by individuals. And that is a, is a fundamental weakness and something which can be built on um, uh, uh, through other uh, proposals that we're making. Um, and it's particularly important to remember this given the emphasis on them during the consultation process and in discussions on the bill. Um, we believe, we believe, as they currently stand, that they can be strengthened um, to ground them further in human rights standards and to reflect the panel principles of participation, accountability, non-discrimination, equality and legality. And the, the, the substance of the um, uh, evidence that we, written evidence we submitted outlines some of the detail of, of the changes that we, we think can be made. Um, but first and foremost, I think, the thing that we would like to see which would underpin everything around the bill is that the bill should enshrine the right to social security in Scots law. Um, as it stands, the bill does not do this. Um, the right to social security was recognised as far back as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Um, and we see it feature in a number of regional and international human rights instruments, most notably that of Article 9 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, and through the General Comment 19 um, of the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, detailed guidance on the content of the right to social security was provided, has been provided. Um, we are, as a government and parliament, mandated to deliver on our international treaties that the UK has signed up to, and the UK has, has, has signed up to the, um, the Covenant on Economic and Social Cultural Rights, of which General Comment 19 on the right to social security is a key part. The right, as it's described in General Comment 19, is broken down into core components, and some of those core components are, have been discussed in detail earlier this morning. So it, this is not territory which is uh, far away or alien to the, the, the discussions we've been having this morning. Um, these are overriding principles of availability, of adequacy, and of accessibility. Key, key um, the reasons they're in general comment 19 is because globally, when we look at social security, these are some of the key, the key um, standards that we're seeking to be very clear on. And under accessibility, those principles cover coverage, eligibility, affordability, participation and in information, and physical access. So the right is described very clearly under general comment 19. Um, as it currently stands, we have a principle in relation to the right to social security, but we do not have the right in this legislation, and we believe a significant strengthening of the legislation would be to enshrine that right in Scots law. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Oswald? Um, I would agree with um, all of my colleagues' points, um, and perhaps just to, to add a, a slightly different perspective, um, I mean, obviously the, uh, the agency and the operation of the social security system in Scotland will be covered by the Human Rights Act and by the Equality Act as well, and the equality duties, so that level of protection is there. The incorporation of the principles into the Charter, though, presents a, potentially an opportunity to have a lower level of resolution to this issue, to these issues. Um, we have, I mean, it is complex and lengthy processes to take a human rights challenge or a challenge under the Equality Act. So potentially, and it just depends on how the Charter develops, um, there's an opportunity to have those, to have a, a lower level of decision making um, or resolution there. Um, I think it would be, as my colleagues have said, extremely helpful to have um, the International Convention on Economic and Social Rights incorporated. Um, I think for the, for the similar reasons to Emma, um, whilst non-discrimination is part of the human rights principles, the Equality Act takes that principle a little further and it goes into um, the issues of advancing equality in community relations, which I think would be useful to have reflected in that. 
And then just lastly, I think um, I've noticed from some of the other um, submissions concerns about the use of the, the terms efficient and value for money in the system. Mm. And I'm, I'm perhaps less concerned about that as long as we're talking about the administration of the system. And I think that the, the discussion at the end of the last se session was really helpful because if you have a system um, which is focused on efficiency and value for money, it will make the right decision the first time round. And one of the most costly and wasteful things that we have in the current system or in the UK system is the continual process of appeal. Mm -hmm. So a focus on efficiency which is beneficial to the claimant um, I think would be extremely helpful. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Adam Tompkins and then Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Camille. Can I, can I just pick up on the really very helpful comments that we just heard from Judith Robertson? And I, I note um, that, Judith, in your um, written evidence, you talk about the charter and the status of the charter, and you say that the charter should be directly enforceable. Can you just expand a bit on what, what you mean by that? And then can I ask the other members of our panel whether they agree with what Judith has to say? Um, so we, the bill lacks clarity on the status of the Charter, as has been previously noted, yeah. um, and there has been some confusion, I think, over its purpose. Um, yeah. We welcome the Charter broadly, uh, mm -hmm. potentially, but we, we believe... <laughs> you'd like to see it, presumably you'd like to see it first, before indeed, you really indeed. want it. Yeah. Well, yes, <laughs> in, in, in principle, it, 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 it could be really helpful, um, but we believe that the right to social security should be set out in the bill. So if we put the right to Social Security in the bill, um, then the Charter, all else flows from that. And the Charter itself de defines the right to Social Security in a way that is accessible to the public. It makes that something that people understand, um, can gain access to, um, and uh, effectively the Charter unpacking in an accessible way the content of the right to Social Security, which in itself should be incorporated in the bill. The Charter should not create new rights and entitlements that have no way of being enforced. And so that's, a, that's a, a fundamental caveat. If we put the right in the bill, on the face of the bill, then, as I say, all else flows from that. Um, we appreciate that the Charter will be dra drafted through an inclusive and participatory process, but we believe at a minimum um, that Charter should reflect the content of the right to Social Security. So we're not... We're, um, so previously, somebody has said um, we should start with a blank sheet in relation to the Charter. The Charter is about Social Security, so it's not a blank sheet. We have to put some, some caveats around what it focuses on, and I think focusing it around the right um, gives it a consistency, a framework, and, crucially, a grounding in international law. Mm. Can I just clarify, when you say the Charter should be enforceable, do you mean enforceable in court? Uh, well, the right to Social Security would be enforceable. In court. in court. The Charter would, from my perspective, define what that means. Right. And therefore, it, there's an option to actually put in the Charter what that, the, the, the accountability processes that flow on from that, or it can be, it, 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 for the purposes, I think that's a decision to be made and something that a participatory process might identify. How much detail do people want in a Charter which says, here are your rights, this is what this is actually entitling you to. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else want to come back in that particular one? Chris Oswald, do you want to come in? Emma Rich and... Yeah, I mean, I, to, to answer the direct question, I do, do agree with what Judith has said. Um, Engender's evidence um, suggests that the Charter should include a mechanism via which claimants could contest a, a breach. Um, and so I think, as, as with as Judith's comments, that would need to be scoped out. There is obviously a tension between the ambition of um, creating a charter that I think the quote from the government's publication in the memorandum was a format that can be easily understood and something which is, is justiciable. Um, so I think that that tension would perhaps need to be worked through, um, but entirely in accordance with Judith's view that without having some kind of redress mechanism, possibly in, in a role for an independent scrutiny body, it does seem that the Charter would, would not have much weight. Just a small... And then it's just up Sorry, to, yes, I mean, that's, that's extremely helpful. Final, very quick follow-up, just to, uh, directly on that. Um, do, do you think, then, if we have a Charter that is judicially enforceable or a right to Social Security that's judicially enforceable, that that will lead to an increase in litigation in the Scottish courts? And if so, who's going to pay for that? And shouldn't there be something in the financial memorandum that accompanies this bill about the likely increase on the calls on the legal aid budget? Um, to be honest, it's very hard to see. I actually think it's very hard to see. So, if the right to Social Security is enshrined in the bill and the principles that that, um, a, a, and therefore is justiciable, 
the processes and policy and regulation which flows from that will have to be compliant with the right to social security because if they were if it isn't it will be contravening the the status of the bill the law within the bill so there's a process there whereby as I say, all else flows from that. And the, what was talked about earlier about getting it right first, mm. uh, having everything in line, um, I think uh, uh, it, it could be very strong. So if that's there, and in principle, the regulation, the, the secondary legislation which flows from that has to be compliant with Article, with General Comment 19 and ISESCAR, then and that can in itself be tested, argued, debated, and understood within the, within the system. You have a much strong, you have a, a a strong framework, but within which you're making decisions about the whole process that flows from this. Um, that can be tested and argued and discussed and debated and transparently done so. Um, and then from then from then, um, yes, there may be cost implications around justiciability. But actually, the implications of some of these processes will be much more rigorously tested up front and in advance. And the legal processes that are supporting the development of regulation are, are in place um, uh, to, to do that within a way that is compliant, clearly within the confines of the law. And so at the moment, that is a, that's a real gap in the bill, actually. It, the, the, that framework isn't... The principles... At, at, I don't want to be... <laughs> I don't want to be cheeky. The framework, the principles really do try to do that. But actually, enshrining the right in the legislation would really make that strong right throughout the process. So yes, ultimately, it would become justiciable. But it's a backstop of protection. It's not the front line of protection. You have all sorts of other protections currently within the, mm -hmm. the, the, the framework of the bill, which, 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 which are about, you know, um, uh, uh, redetermination processes, um, tribunal processes, there are all sorts of processes before you would get to a point of actually taking something to court. So we're, you know, we're, in a, we're on a journey. Chris Oswald, would you want to come back on that? Mr Harry, and then it's Ruth Maguire. Thank you. Um, I think it's again important to remember that the Human Rights Act and the Equality Act apply already in this jurisdiction. So um, there is just disability on the table immediately. Mm -hmm. um, I would hope that the incorporation of principles around equality and human rights would lead to a more anticipatory approach by the agency where it would start to identify these issues in advance. Um, and also, again, subject to what the Charter um, enables or allows, it gives the possibility of resolving issues at a lower level without having to go to court to do so. So again, I think it's, there is an advantage in this, and I, I think the costs of, um, ju of just disability are just there anyway, irrespective of whether it's on the face of the bill. Thank you. Mr Harry. Yeah, I mean, as Chris says, the Equality Act <coughs> applies, but we know from public sector generally it's not enough. That's why the Charter was seen as a good thing. Uh, at the moment, it is sitting a little bit alone because there's no um, linkage, but we, we see it as setting an attitude. I think that's what people have been saying about what the, the bill and the agency will be about and how it will perform its functions. So, but yeah, obviously we need to see it. Um, we are arguing that at the moment, I think the bill requires users or um, claimants as, as, um, to be consulted, but not equalities groups. And we'd like to see that in the legislation, that equalities groups will be consulted before the charter is finalized. Okay. Thank you. Did you want to give a name? And that would be an interest I did. I, I can also see the virtue in a, a less adversarial process, um, whereby, for example, um, if an independent scrutiny body is created, and I think it should be, as, as do others, um, then there would be a, a scope for policy concerns to be raised by interested organisations. That wouldn't be going to law, but if Engender, for mm -hmm. example, was aware of a widespread unintended consequence in the process or policy of the agency that seemed to defy what I hope will be the principle of equality and non-discrimination in the Charter, that we could alert, um, alert the independent scrutiny body who could then make a determination. And that would be equivalent to the way that equality bodies tend to operate across Europe. The EHRC is actually quite unusual in not having that quasi-judicial role. Um, and that may be a helpful way of, of getting concerns back into the system in a way that I think could become a bit of a virtuous circle. Mm. Thank you very much for that. Okay. I just wanted to uh, endorse that, that 
accountability mechanisms within a, a piece of legislation like this are multifarious. They, they add up, they stack up, and as I think at the moment there are some gaps in it, particularly that one around accountability and scrutiny, and, and the process that Emma has described I think really well articulates where, but with that additional backstop, which currently doesn't exist in the legislation, um, would, would complete that picture. Thank you. Uh, Ruth McGuire, key convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I wish we were having all of them, but the fact is that it, in the main, it's um, carers and disability benefits that are being devolved and that we're going to have responsibility for. So with that in mind, how can the right to social security be enshrined when it's just, when it's just that portion that we're getting? Very good point. Uh, that's a constraint that will be true across any piece, almost any piece of policy legislation that Scotland has, in the sense that we don't have absolute power over many of the levers of, 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 of authority. So, from my perspective, this is a, an important piece of legislation. Um, it's a landmark piece of legislation. It, it, it will, the, the right to social security will only be enshrined in what this legislation can provide. It, it, it doesn't extend into legislation that it can't, that this can't provide. It doesn't extend into Westminster. It, it, it will only be contained within within this legislation. So, um, so, however, I do want to say something else about that because if if it's in the face of this bill, it will make this a world leading piece of legislation. This legislation will be leading by example, and from my perspective, will also provide what we used to call in my Oxfam days the threat of a good example. Because good examples test the barriers of everybody else's systems. It, w w and I think that's a really important aspect. It's not the reason I, I think it should be in this legislation. I think it should be in this legislation because in and of itself, the, it provides a set of principles and frameworks that are consistent, enshrined in international law, and that, the, that, that can be understood and, 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 and worked on consistently. Um, but it does lots of other things. And those consequences, I think, in terms of social security globally, which reputationally isn't great. It's not just reputationally bad in Britain. It's, it, it, it's, some countries have very good reputations around social securities, others have less so. So I think, I think we have an opportunity to do it really well here. And the government is, is, is in that territory. And what we're seeing is seeking to, to make it as strong as it can be. Just, just really briefly. I always come back to the folk that come into my constituency office and the people that I'm representing. And while I wouldn't argue with, with any of, of, of what you said, it's, it's laudable. Is there a danger that, in terms of expectations, that we're, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a tension because we're, we're still going to have to, and the people that are, are using um, the system that are entitled to social security are often going to be um, receiving um, services from, from both administrations mm. and I do I mean it might sound strange but I, I, I worry about setting false expectations for, the, for, for people that we are representing I think if we are to effectively deliver on the, the, the spirit in which this legislation is put forward which is clearly to put some distance between um, uh, the way our current um, social security system is, is administered and, and a new one that Scotland provides, I think we have to raise expectations, actually. We do have to see people well, we have, have to a right... Well, we have to meet expectations, I think. Well, we have to <laughs> raise expectations as well that people's relationship to a social security system is something they can have with dignity, they can have it with respect, they don't need to feel ashamed of being in receipt of benefits, that we can change the terms and culture around social security in this country in a way that... We can't do it across the system. That is a clear limitation of where we're at in relation to, in relation to this legislation, clearly. Um, but we can do it within the bit that we have the authority and power over. And if we don't, we're failing to realise the ambition that it can be done better, it can be done well, it can be done in a way that supports people to receive that to which they are entitled to. That is what we want. They are entitled to these benefits. And we, we do want that to be strong and, and supported. Sure. Chris Oswald, do you want to come in? Um, thank you, and again, I agree with um, <laughs> Judith's point. Um, I think that, um, obviously, we are where we are, and we can't change the, the settlement as it stands today. Um, what is encouraging is that we're moving in Scotland towards a more enabling rather than punitive system, and I think that is to be commended. 
But I think it's also important that we look at the relationships in Scotland, the stuff that we do control and we do have um, power over. So the social security system that we're developing, the regulations, the operation of the system will be as dependent on the adequacy of services on the ground provided by local authorities or the voluntary sector. It will be affected by health and social care integration. It will have huge impact. It will be hugely influenced by the availability of adequate housing. Mm -hmm. So I think in some ways, I think we need to, to think more about how does this fit with other areas of Scottish social policy and that enabling rather than punitive approach that is being adopted in Scotland, rather than worrying too much about the, what we cannot control at this point. Um, so I would be very interested, and I think again, I mean, the, the discussion about advocacy, um, which was very much in the panel before, um, whilst I respect the, the, ad, the provision of advocacy may in Scotland may be better, it's not perfect. And I think we need to move towards systems where we can actually guarantee stuff rather than just saying you have a right to advocacy. Actually, the right is achievable and real. Sure. Emma, you wanted to come in. I think George Ashton wanted to come in and sub on that question. But Emma. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's a really helpful question about carers. So if I could just talk specifically about that and how I think that illustrates that principle is really so important and vital on the face of this bill. Um, in 2015, the Welfare Reform Committee published its report on women and social security, and it made a, a number of recommendations uh, for government, obviously in an, uh, anticipating the, the Scotland Act uh, by some months. But it said that Scottish government needs to look at the gender impact of their policy decisions and mitigate these, and particularly design social security programmes to overcome barriers to prevent um, women's labour market participation. Um, and that's something which a, a number of committees in this place have, have reflected on. Um, the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee has just published a really helpful inquiry report into the, the, the question of the pay gap. Um, and the reason this is important for carers is that I think the schedule of this bill at the moment does somewhat replicate the status quo. There's a really welcome uplift in the level um, of support to carers, and that brings it on par with other uh, in-work, um, um, working age um, pieces of social security assistance. But it does contain some features which potentially in regulation could replicate what we've already got. And those are um, whether or not a carer is in education or how many hours a week the carer spends caring and what employment they are in. And I think all of those things have, have a risk of um, repeating what we have, which functions as a barrier to carers getting into the workplace, to developing their skills and capacity while they're on their what's called called carer journey um, and therefore are not qualified or skilled appropriately um, when that care ends. Um, and so I think we do have a, an opportunity to be bold and different in the regulation around that carer's social security assistance. However, without the principle on the face of the bill, it's not clear that gender and the specific impacts on women who care, the majority of carers, 75% of recipients of that particular entitlement are women, um, what that will look like. And so I think that does make the case for um, the principle of equality and non-discrimination on the face of the bill, um, but also the vital need um, to pick up on that challenge of the Welfare Reform Committee in 2015, which is that Scottish Government does need to look at the equality impact assessment of all of this stuff in the round and how it articulates with other bits of policy. Um, and agenda certainly echoes the disappointment of the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights in finding the equality impact assessment just inadequate at the moment. Thank you. George Adams to come with a supplementary. Good morning. Uh, I would just like to follow up on what Ruth already mentioned there. You know, if I get the idea that if we enshrine it and, uh, uh, and we can internationally, people will actually look at the human rights that we've got, social security is a human right, look at it and might force other legislations to think the same way as well. I get all that. I get the vision thing. But Ruth brought up the very practical idea of people who are dealing with the day-to-day -day issues of uh, access in the social security system. And some, pe some people may go to a DWP office and say, but I've got this bit of paper from the Scottish Parliament that says I've got social security as a right. I've got this right to be able to do this. And the DWP will sit there and say, no, you haven't. You know, and then they'll say, ah, but it's the Scottish Parliament's passed this. It's exactly what Bruce is saying about expectation. And they'll say, we don't recognise that. 
And then you get into Adam Tompkins' territory of possibly if someone ends up going to litigation at a future date as well. And there's a different legislations on both sides of uh, the border as well. You know, it gets quite complicated. And on the actual delivery and the individuals who are all trying to help at the end of the day, does that not build up such an expectation that they get to the stage that they end up thinking that bit of paper or that bill, that bit that says that they've got that right, a uh, waste of time? Did anyone want to make a quick comment on, uh, which I thought was a question, but obviously there's questions in there. Anyone want to make a quick comment on that? So for me, the complexity of the system is 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 there anyway? To be honest, um, uh, I think I think that's a, a clear a, a clear thing um, from my perspective. Independent advocacy and effective the provision of effective independent advocacy is going to help people understand what their entitlements and their rights are within the process and the limitations on that. It's really important. It's not, to be honest, that just that is. Uh, whether the right is there or not, that is going to be an issue. And that's what that's what the previous panel was articulating very clearly. Um, the Charter in and of itself will articulate, is intended to articulate what people's rights are. Um, from, from my perspective, enshrining the right to social security makes that a very clear process. It makes it, and, and, and puts that, puts that out there, makes it explicit. It, it doesn't apply to Westminster clearly. Um, and, and people will need help to understand that, definitely. Mr Harry, you wanted to come in. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't want to get into the constitutional question, but um, so what you say may be true, but there are also benefits. Um, I'll give two examples which are more particular for black minority ethnic communities. Uh, the question of stigma is a key issue, stigma of claiming benefits. So if you can reduce that for devolved benefits, it will, I think, obviously reduce for all benefit claimants. Uh, and there's a some research that shows us underclaiming under within black communities of benefits. So again, if we do it better in Scotland and people claim more of what they're entitled to, I assume they will increase their claims for reserved benefits as well. So there are different benefits as much as there may be problems. Thank you. Mark Griffin. Thanks, Kavina. Just You just touched on it there in that point about independent advocacy. And I'd just like to ask all members of the panel whether um, they feel that there is a need for independent advocacy in the system and indeed whether there should be a, a right to it set out on the face of the bill. Um, would you want to come in first? And... Oh, I'm happy to. Yes, uh, Engender supports the independent advocacy and I think um, other submissions that have been made have really clearly set out um, what, what principles should apply to that. I think um, the entitlement should be either on the face of the bill or within the charter or some other appropriate place. Um, I think that for the very well rehearsed reasons we heard from the, the first panel, um, that, that advocacy is important. And particularly in the context of George Adams' point, I think the cat is out of the bag in terms of the different ambitions for a social security system in Scotland. Um, I think because of the, the road shows that have happened across Scotland with, with communities setting out the ambitions for a system that has dignity and respect at its heart, communities are expecting to see that. Um, and I think advocacy can be one way in which those um, least able to articulate and advocate for themselves are able to understand the myriad complexities of these two interlocking systems that I'm sure not one person and sitting in this room would have designed if it had been up to us to um, allocate power, responsibility and process um, between two uh, different um, bits of state. Thank you. Chris, you wanted to come in? Again, yes, um, completely. Uh, we, would, we should have the right to independent advocacy. But I think the issue is more critical is that people have the ability to access it. Um, we have seen massive reductions in Scotland in terms of um, provision for the advice service. Uh, as things get more complex, and I think this is one of the issues which comes up in um, both the EIA and in other submissions, uh, if people have a 30-day appeal window um, but they don't have access to communication support or advocacy which is particularly tailored to their specific need, which might be driven by disability or age, um, then we need to, to think, these are very, very complex systems which citizens will struggle, uh, many citizens will struggle to, to deal with. So I think we do need to have it built in, but we also need to talk about what does adequate 
independent advocacy mean um, and are there potential impacts in terms of in, in inadvertent impacts in terms of the appeals um, timetables which might potentially disadvantage or discriminate against some sections of the community yeah, again absolutely. this is all part of the design mm -hmm. which we're now starting to move into mm -hmm. Did you, just, did you want to come in? Mr. Just to add, yeah. um, so within the right to social security as defined under General Comment 19, it's clear that the social security system would ensure the right of individuals to seek, receive and impart information on all social security entitlements in a clear and transparent manner. So the, the, again, enshrining that, that right um, on the face of the bill leads to those principles coming alive, being addressed, being looked at. Um, I think we need to remember as well and that this is where I think the importance of um, the panel principles, participation, the experience of the lived experience of people in engaging with systems like this um, is 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 difficult. So, um, and we think that people require social security at times of their life when they are generally most vulnerable, um, and so that is the underlying principle around which we determine whether or not those rights uh, it should be applied. And, and that, for me, is, is, shouldn't be forgotten in the technicalities of taking forward a bill process, that actually we're seeking to both meet our, regular, our, our um, requirements under equalities legislation, but under human rights international law, we're seeking to address the needs of the most, some of the most vulnerable people first, foremost, and with priority. So th that, for, for me, is what underpins that, that principle. Did you want to come in, Mr. Roswell, before I bring in your next speaker? Next Just, I think, sort of touching on that and something which Jessica Burns mentioned um, in the previous session, it's about the, the attitude and approach of the system, of the new social security system. There is nothing to prevent reconsideration before an appeal, for example. So advocacy doesn't have to be adversarial. It could mm -hmm. actually be more. And again, it comes down to what is the purpose of the social security system. And in one way, you could say, the, the ethos in Scotland appears to be moving towards um, the promotion of public good in the sense of it's a joined up system which works with other parts of the, um, of the social welfare systems to promote and advance people's income and rights, or is it um, posited primarily on the protection of public money? Um, mm. And I think that's a, it's a very interesting juncture that we're at. Thank you. Ben McPherson. Thank you, Convener. I was going to ask a, a similar question to my colleague Ruth Maguire, but I just, uh, given on what's been discussed, I maybe just want to just try and clarify the situation with regard to Ruth and, and George's questions. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but clearly from uh, my position is that uh, a full right to social security within Scots and or international law is not deliverable by the Scottish Government because of the nature of devolution. So, is the proposition that there would be a right to social security within the competence of the Scotland Act that you're proposing. Yes. Yeah. So if that was defined, I'm just thinking from a drafting perspective, um, the right, a right to social security per se is not what you're advocating in fact. What you're advocating is a right to social security within the devolved competencies yes. of this parliament. I, 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 it would have to be, and there are certain caveats. Um, there are certain caveats around the creation of the Scotland Act um, that 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 have implications for that. We are going to do a piece of work on what that would actually look like in in the Scottish context. So within the devolved competence of the Scottish Government and Parliament, we're, we're, the Commission is going to do a bit of work to generate a clear sense of that in relation to this legislation. If that helps, we haven't done that yet, but we're 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 going to do that. Thank you for that clarification, and I look forward to, to, to uh, reviewing what, what comes forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jeremy Balfour. We've had a, a very helpful discussion around a fairly limited area of, of the bill, important but limited. I suppose I'm interested to get the panel's view on the wider bill, and going back to the question that was asked to the previous panels, how much should be in the primary legislation and how much should be in regulations and in secondary legislation. And I suppose I'm interested, from your perspective, maybe looking at other systems across the world, would your preference be to have more than is in the bill at the moment in it, or are you content to see regulations 
fairly detailed regulations follow. And I think also just picking up my comment made by uh, my colleague again previously, do you think there should be a, a specific piece of um, section in the bill to say that we can create new social security benefits and should that be on the face of the bill at this stage as well? Who wants to pick up that one first? Emma. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to the, the first question about the, the division between primary and secondary legislation, I think Engender's in, in submission is fairly clear in saying that we would want to see more on the face of the bill than exists. Um, I think that parliamentary scrutiny is vital, uh, particularly when we're considering a social security bill that contains quite a lot, but also needs to articulate well with another system which has significant complexity. Um, and we have been particularly sensitised to the flaws of secondary legislation in our recent experience of the rape clause, which I think was not intended necessarily to have the impact that it had when it was first conceived, but a lack of parliamentary scrutiny surely did not help the shape that it ultimately took. And I think we would want to avoid um, avoid that kind of unintended consequence wherever possible. Um, I think in terms of other systems, we've made reference to Canada, um, where quite detailed rules, including eligibility criteria, are prescribed in primary legislation. Um, doubtless there are many more, and I'm sure others are more qualified than us to comment on those. Um, I do think it is vital that um, new entitlements uh, and the capacity to create those are included on the face of the bill. We would also put in some other measures, including the universal credit flexibilities, which are now within the um, power of the Scottish Parliament, uh, and particularly would want to see uh, one of our long-term calls, which has been for um, individual payments for universal credit rather than household payments included on the face of the bill. We think the evidence that that is in the interests of women's equality and rights is um, is absolutely uh, uncontested at this point, and so I would want to see that um, in terms of future proofing incorporated into this legislation. Chris Oswald, do you want to come in? No, I was okay. um, not Judith really Robson. So, okay. um, I suppose in principle, so my first, com my first principal comment about enshrining the right to social security in the face of the bill and what that actually would look like and the detail that would be given in that, in that, that. Uh, uh, that clause, effectively, a new clause in the legislation, would, would outline a, a whole range of processes which would then have impact on the rest of the legislation. And as it currently stands, there are some gaps that we would see as, as not being there. One of the key ones is around accountability um, and the scrutiny mechanism. So that, just to be explicit about that, that conver you've had that conversation earlier this morning, but I, I, just to, to I, and you may well go on to that in your line of questioning. But, but from our perspective, the, the scrutiny mechanism is, is absent. Um, it needs to have some clear principles underpinning it. It needs to be there, firstly. It, 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 and it needs to have some clear principles underpinning it. It needs to be independent. It needs to be statutory, it should report to the Parliament directly, it should have a broad mandate with enough powers to carry out that mandate and it needs to be have some element of public accountability in that its reports are published and made public and that there's a transparent process around it. So, so we would say that that is absent from the bill and in terms of the, the balance, whether, whether that's a balance issue, it shouldn't come, it should be on the face of the bill. Um, we, there are other things we would strengthen within that accountability process. Um, the reporting, there is a, a, a duty on ministers to report. Um, there's very little clarity on what the ministers would need to report. Um, and we would add to that that, the, that, that some indicators should be established um, which are which are very clear against which the minister should be reporting. Now, if the right to social security is in, enshrined in the bill, those indicators would be indicators which would be driven by, by the right. Um, and they could be established in a participatory process, they can be subject to review, they can be, there's, there's no issue with flexibility around that, but the fact of them probably could be added to the face of the bill, therefore enhancing that um, accountability process. So yeah, we, there are a range of things that we would add. Um, uh, to be honest, listening to the session this morning um, and listening to the conversation that you had around aspects of what's on the face of the bill and what isn't, at some levels, given that regulation is subject to less scrutiny, more is, more is better. Uh, yes, absolutely, that would be a principle. Yeah. 
Mr Hyde. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Um, just, I, I don't know if this is going to get a tangent, but hopefully not. But we were really excited to see in the partial EQIA for the bill that uh, the ministers are saying the agency must be an exemplar of equality uh, for the Scottish public sector, both in terms of support provided to people across all protected characteristics and in terms of employment opportunities offered. Now, that has disappeared from the final EQIA, and there's some comment about being an international exemplar mm. in regard to dignity and respect. That's not quite the same thing as being an exemplar on equality uh, in terms of the operation within Scotland. So there's already some slippage, and you know, the more scrutiny on these things, the better. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Alison Johnson is the last question. Please. Yeah, thank you. And I'll probably um, I'll, I'll address my question to Emma Rich, if I may, just because of the nature of it. And, you know, the gendered impacts of uh, welfare reform are well documented, particularly by yourself, for which many thanks. Um, I just wondered... I mean, I think it's so difficult, particularly for, for women who are juggling many responsibilities, to access the system in the first place if you had a view on the right to income maximisation, you know, just people understanding exactly what they're entitled to and, and where they should go. Um, and we know from evidence of government programmes that can be really hugely successful, making sure people, you know, increase quite markedly the amount of income that household has access to. Um, do you agree there should be a right to income maximisation support and what should that look like? Emma. The this is not something in gender is considered in detail, so I'd like to follow up in writing if I could. Uh -huh. um, I know that Scottish Government has funded um, some advocacy programmes that have resulted in quite significant income maximisation for households. And so I entirely agree that, um, that the system is at present confusing. Um, I think it runs the risk of becoming much more confusing as it tries to articulate with um, the social security system of the UK. I think that I've heard the principle um, in our discussions with civil servants of no wrong front door so that uh, individuals approaching either agency uh, will get signposting and not turned away if they've inadvertently approached the wrong agency. Um, but I do think there are some things in the bill which may uh, be very difficult for women in terms of the propensity to approach agencies with information. Um, and one of those is the, the seeming... Um the, the, the seeming harshness of the question around overpayments and whether notification may result in overpayments being clawed back that have perhaps been the, the fault of the agency in making a, a wrong determination in the beginning. Um, but I think there was also a really interesting point raised by Justice Scotland in their written submission about criminalisation, which seems to sit at odds to Scottish Government's understanding in other uh, policy domains of the the um, question of female imprisonment and wanting to reduce female imprisonment, um, but seemingly criminalising uh, mistakes and um, errors that were made without full knowledge of the impact of those errors in reporting and communicating. Um, so I think that there should be additional support for people to, to try and wend their way through this thicket, and I will come back to you on the specific question of um, the right that you set out. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to ask, does any of the panel want to make any final comments? My final comment would be around the right to social security in the broader context. So ideally, um, we wouldn't incorporate in isolation the right to social security. And it kind of addresses your point as well, Alison. We would incorporate economic and social cultural rights into Scots law, which therefore would look at adequate standards of living, um, maximising income, a whole range of other rights through which the right to social security would be one component by which we would be supporting people's economic and social cultural rights. So ideally, we would be seeing the incorporation of all economic and social cultural rights into Scots law. And we welcome the Scottish Government's recent announcement and establishment of um, an independent mm -hmm. process to really look at how that can be enhanced and developed that uh, my former, my predecessor, Professor Alan Miller, is, is leading. So I think that's a, that's a welcome development in terms of the broader context and maybe provide some answers to some of the concerns here around if we do it for this, you know, it, it, what does that do? Well, actually, we need, we need to be bringing that much more broadly into into public discussion and debate. Thank you. 
Does anyone else want to make a final comment, uh, Mr Harry? To sum up, really, um, we hope you'd support the equality principle that we're arguing for. Uh, we hope there is far more <coughs> consultation with equality groups uh, throughout the whole process. And uh, we've not really touched on this, but we hope that as much equality monitoring data would be collected as part of this process and all the way through and analysed, and then we can look at any discrepancies and deal with those. Okay. Mr Oswald, did you want to mention it, um, I think it, the, the bill and the scrutiny is to be welcomed. Um, it is something which both I think ourselves and the Scottish Human Rights Commission have seen as such a, a fundamental opportunity to advance equality and human rights in Scotland in a way which has not been done elsewhere, um, that we're acting very much as critical friends in this area. Um, I'll just touch on something Jatin said and then um, something which um, also came up on, uh, from a previous question. We are um, working with the agency to try and get as much data as possible. So we are, again, hopefully we will get what we possibly can. My only closing thing, and it's something which has come up a number of times but has not really been addressed in this committee, is the distinction between errors and omissions and fraud. Mm. And I think it's something which we need to be really much more clear about. That there is clearly organised fraud of, of social security mm -hmm. systems. We know that, and there are need to be sanctions or there needs to be um, legislation around that. But where there are genuine errors and omissions, the idea that people will be, um, income will be withdrawn from, they'll be subject to lengthy investigations, I think runs against the spirit of what the legislation is attempting to do, um, what the convention rights are, and um, against the, well, no, against it. <laughs> Thank you. I think you were very succinct there, and I think we all got uh, the meaning. Emma, did you want to say? That? I know you had answered the question fully. I think just just a final um, just a final call for the incorporation of the principle of equality non discrimination on the face of the bill bill and the importance of that and to say how much we welcome the spirit of this bill um, but believe that equality could usefully be added into human rights where that's specifically mentioned for example um, the, the welcome commitment to train agency staff on human rights based approaches I think our disability disabled people's organisation colleagues um, race equality organisations gender equality organisations have experience in the front line of working on things like the Scottish Welfare Fund training for staff and so I think could usefully be brought into that mix okay, Thank you all very much and thank you for, for your answers very interesting and we will obviously follow some up and we we'll look forward Judith to when your report is commissioned if, you, if it is in time could you pass us a copy or let us know <laughs> the, Which one? The, the one you were speaking about Yes, yes. I, I, okay. <laughs> That would be great, thank you so much uh, We now move, move into private session Thank you